Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. This is Pastor Dave, and this is Christmas time, a time when we can remember the greatest gift that anyone gave anyone was God giving us his son. And what a tremendous opportunity it is for us to share the gospel with our neighbors and to kind of unravel this thing that is so well propagated in our society about who Jesus the Christ is. And so as we consider that, I would hope that you would pray with me for our hearts to be ready. Father, I pray for all those who hear this word from your Bible that you might enlarge our hearts, that you might sharpen our minds, and you might quicken our feet to do your will, that we would be ready with the good news of Christmas on our lips as we rub elbows with people, as we spend time with family, and that you might help us, Lord, to seek to understand the true meaning of it. So this year, Lord, I pray that you might help us, even in the difficult times in which we are, that you would help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. The passage I've selected is Matthew chapter 2, which is not your typical Christmas message or passage, but it's, it gives us a little different perspective on it. If you remember, Matthew's gospel always talks about Jesus as the Messiah and the, the king of heaven. So as we look through that, he's going to come at it from that perspective. And he tells us a, uh, an event that occurred during the birth of Christ and after that no one else tells in any of the gospels. And so as we take a look at it, I'm, I'm selecting Matthew chapter four, uh, chapter two, rather, uh, verse four, which it says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And of course, these are those that we understand as the Magi following a star, this strange astrological event so many people are thinking about. In fact, we're going to have one this year. They're calling it the Christmas star. It only happens every 800 years or so. It's the alignment of Saturn and Jupiter. And it's really a, a double planet showing that looks like uh, one singular event, but it's not. Uh, so you, you can be aware that this is not what that is talking about. But let's go through and look at the passage. I, I always want to begin with kind of a, uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, once upon a time, a far, far uh, place from here, this thing happened. And it's always the way the Christmas story is kind of couched and almost a folklore, almost like it's not real, and the characters are made almost like a, a fiction piece, we have an opportunity to share the true meaning of what it means and the historicity of it that it actually happened. So as we go into the scriptures, beginning with Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, 
flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Then he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and its districts from two years old and under according to the time in which he had determined from the wise men. Then it was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. As we look at the story of Jesus coming and being born, we see kind of the after story because this talks about after he was born. Most people, when they put the stories together, they put the shepherds at the, at, at the manger and they put the wise men at the manger. But this was after Jesus was born. And so this was a subsequent um, arrival. And so let's look at it. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. It's interesting. If you look at some of the terms that are in here, first of all, it says after. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. So this is a time period that comes afterwards. And it's interesting, the timing of all of this. It could have been, it was definitely over a year, but it, could, it was probably less than two because we see Herod inquires when the child was to be born and he begins to wipe out all the male children in that area. So it's probably between one and two years after Jesus is born. Herod, Herod was a position actually. This is Herod uh, the Great who was declared king uh, by Rome he stays in, and he's in charge of Jerusalem until about 4 AD. He's, he is a wicked man. He has 10 wives, and he kills them off one at a time. He assassinates at least two, if not three, of his own sons because he thought that they were plotting to take his position. So this is a very insecure man, and he's kind of laid himself thin and opened himself you know, by having 10 wives. It's uh, difficult enough to make one work. Now you have 10 wives, and he actually killed his favorite wife because he thought she was conspiring to take his position for one of her sons as opposed to one of the other sons. So this is Herod the Great. The Magi, or the wise men, you can see it mentioned in Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2 and 4 and, and 5. Daniel was put in charge when he was in Persia of creating this whole sect of people that were astronomers. And they were, um, if you remember, Daniel could interpret dreams and he was gifted by God to do so. Well, he was in charge of all these, what you might call magicians, but they weren't magicians, you know, like pulling a rabbit out of their hat. These were astronomers, people of science, very well learned folk at, that Daniel had under him. And this is years later, they're coming from Persia, which is to the east, coming all the way across. There's 800 miles that they traverse to come to see Jesus, and they're following a star. And it's not just any star. It, they're coming to Jerusalem, which is the very center of the religious and the prophetic word about who, uh, you know, God has chosen the Jewish people, and he's going to show himself through Jerusalem. The son of David was predicted that he would sit on his father's throne in Jerusalem. And so that's where they go. And it says that they were asking, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The tense of it is they were asking everyone. They were going through town and saying, hey, have you heard about this king of the Jews? Do you know where we can find him? And it says that they were going through Jerusalem and eventually it led to them coming before Herod, the king. They said, you, you got to get a load of this. Now, most people think that there were only three because there are three gifts. 
And yet the Magi came, and they came 800 miles, probably not just three guys by themselves, probably a large caravan. Because it also says that all of Jerusalem was worried with Herod. Not just because this, you know, power-crazed man uh, was unhappy about all this, someone proclaiming another king while he's still alive, which is a little unsettling for anyone, but most of all him. But now they're coming and looking for the king of the Jews, which are a subjugated people at this time. So he's nervous, and all of Jerusalem is nervous, maybe by the numbers of people that came, but also because Herod is nervous, and so everyone else is nervous. Um, his own son, Herod's son, says it's better to be a pig than to be Herod's son, because uh, they don't eat pig in Jerusalem, uh, but they do kill Herod's sons in Jerusalem. So that was uh, Augustine, I believe, that said that. The king of kings, who was Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the one who was promised to come to be the lamb of God, but also to be the king to sit on David's throne and to be the deliverer of Israel. All of the, the signs were pointing to it, and we've looked at that previously. All of the prophecies that came true all the way up to this point, and they're looking for who Jesus is. It says that we followed his star. It doesn't say they followed a star. It says they followed his star. Star. It's rather interesting. There are some prophecies given by Balaam, given by Daniel, given by others, talking about a star that would come, and it was referring to Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that God used a literal star. Now, star has been used for other things, too, like a celestial being or an angel or any of that. Uh, the star of the morning has been referred to Jesus. It's another way of referring to him. So when you think of star, you're thinking of a, a, you're thinking of a, a supernova, you're thinking of a sun like what we have, and yet it's a little bit more liberal in the original language. They're following his star, which is rather interesting. From the east, they were in the east in Susa, probably, which is the, the main city there in, in, uh, in Persia. And it was 800 miles away. And so they were traveling all of this time from the time that the star showed itself to the time that they got there was somewhere between one and two years for them to traverse all of that property. So it's rather interesting. And God placed this there, leading them on. So they were in the east and the star was actually west. But if you look here, it says that they were in the east and that they saw his star in the east. What they mean is, we saw his star while we were in the east, not that the star was in the east. So it can be a bit confusing with the language, but that's what it says. So, and they have come to worship. They have come to worship the child king. I don't know about you, but the only one who accepts worship is God himself which is another proof that Jesus is deity. He is man, but he is also God. And so to confuse that or to try to cover it up and pretend that doesn't exist is just self-deceit, really. We have come to worship him. And what a great thing that God led these non-Jewish men across all of this plain and desert to come and see Jesus. You know, God is still doing it today, and I think there are wise men that still seek him. I've seen that on bumper stickers. But God will use supernatural means to bring people to Jesus who are far away, who you would otherwise think they don't have a shot. And yet God calls them to himself. I hope that you have a similar testimony as the wise men did. In verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So he was troubled. He was upset. Somebody is proclaiming another king that the king has been born. He, being very defensive about his throne, killing off his favorite wife and some sons, he is very paranoid about losing power. And so what he does is he calls some of his, he calls all of the Jewish scribes together. And he wants to get a consensus. Guys, where is this Christ going to be born? Not that he cares, not that he's going to make a birthday present, but he wants to know where this new king is because he's already a murderous, power-crazed um, dictator. 
So he wants to know where, and he was troubled. And it says all of Jerusalem was troubled because with a man like Herod at the helm, you just don't know which way his blade's going to fall. In verse 5, and so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So it is said in, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that there would be a shepherd who arises. It's interesting because Bethlehem was the town of David who was a shepherd before he was a king. And it's interesting. All of those things in the Old Testament were there as foreshadows of Jesus. Jesus comes as the king of kings. He also is the one who is the shepherd. He's also the sacrificial lamb of God. All of that tying together in the little insignificant town of Bethlehem. It's a very rocky place from what I understand. It did not have a high population, especially at the time when they were there. It was not a big deal. So it's, it's just about five miles south of where Jerusalem is. And so he says, these are my, out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So now he knows where they're going and where they're heading. And it's interesting that they knew who, who Jesus was and when he would be born and where. So then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Now, why is that important? Because it's going to tell him the age of the child from the time that the, the star goes up to the time they got there. That's why he secretly called them aside and he wanted to know. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Well, it sounds like Herod is interested in buying a birthday gift for Jesus. He's going to come, maybe bring the queen, you know, show up with a gift. He makes it sound so congenial because he says, I'm going to come and worship as well. And, you know, Herod wasn't going to do that. He was going to kill him. And as we know the rest of the story and how it goes, be careful of people that tell you what their motives are when, it, when you can tell otherwise from their behavior. So he's looking on and hoping that these guys will come back and report to him so he can go ferret this king of the Jews out and eliminate him. You can see how Satan is just trying to put an end of God's greatest gift and try to put the end to our possible salvation. In verse 9, and when they heard the king, they departed, meaning, meaning the Magi. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The interesting thing is they came from Persia and they, and they went all the way across and came to Jerusalem. Now they, they leave Herod and they go outside and they see this star, but now it's going south. Regular astronomical bodies don't do such things. They don't take you east and then, or they don't take you west and then take you south. They're always fixed in the sky at the time of day. So you have to wonder, what was this star? It could have been some supernatural thing that God did. It could have been an angel. We know that when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that he glowed, that he was so radiant that the disciples couldn't even look at him. And I, I wonder if it wasn't a celestial being that took them there. It could have been Gabriel, could have been anyone. But notice he led them all of this time, the star did, right to where they needed to be. And it said that the star stood over the house where they lived. Now, that's not the action of any regular star, but it does sound like a supernatural event. So if you see... If you look at the chart, over here to the right is Persia, way over here. And they came across, came to Jerusalem, and then it took them south to Bethlehem. Stars don't do that, but angels might. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child. By the way, young child, that word means it was a toddler. 
It wasn't an infant, it was a toddler. So if you look at the wording, it even tells us that Jesus was not an infant and he wasn't in a manger. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream so that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So these guys had a relationship with God and God spoke to them and said, don't go back to Herod and told him what the, the jig was with Herod, that he wasn't a good guy. So imagine <laughs> you're, you're Joseph and you hear a knock at the door and it's the middle of the night. You don't see stars normally in the daytime. And it's funny that the star didn't appear to everyone. It only appeared to them. And of course, it's probably at night and you get a knock at the door and here's some really foreign looking people showed up at your door and you look up above and it looks like there's a helicopter with a, a spotlight on your house and before there was electricity or helicopters and they say, he's here, isn't he? The king of the Jews. And they go into the house and there's Mary and there's young Jesus, not a baby, but a toddler, somewhere between one and two years old. And they come in and they worship a child. First of all, worshiping another human being is a problem, but worshiping a child is even weirder. Uh, I've seen a lot of parents do that and that's idolatry. But this was God's gift to the world through a virgin woman. This is Jesus, who is also God. And so they presented their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, gold, the most precious metal that there was, and this was a gift to the family. It really wasn't, what's Jesus going to do with gold? It's symbolic of his kingship, that he had authority. The frankincense was used by priests in incense in the temple, and it was used for worship. It was symbolic of prayer going up. They also took frankincense and put it in the showbread, which was on the table every single morning at the tabernacle, reminder of God's provision. And so this speaks of his priesthood that he would be coming into. And then myrrh, which is used as an ointment to treat bodies when they're dead. And so uh, the, the word myrrh actually uh, has the same root as Smyrna, which is one of the uh, places in, uh, the, in the book of Revelation, one of the churches, which was tortured. And uh, it, it basically means suffering. So myrrh and Smyrna have kind of the same base and it speaks of his suffering and of his death, that he would be the sacrificial lamb of God. He would be the king of kings. He would be our high priest who intercedes for us, but he would also have to die and that he would um, give his life for us, for our salvation. So those three gifts speak of those things. And what a great thing it probably was for this family who was very poor. We see in the book of Luke that when they came to the temple to dedicate Jesus, they dedicate him and they only have doves that they can offer as a sacrifice. If you had the wherewithal, you would bring a lamb, and they didn't have that. They were only able to give these, these doves, which shows that they were poor. What a tremendous thing it is for their accounts to suddenly go up because of the visit of these men from Persia, which must have shocked them uh, as they knocked on the door that night. And they present their gifts, not only that, but they probably have their entourage with them, which is a bit impressive. And they come to Joseph and Mary and to Jesus and they worship the child. What an incredible, incredible vision that must have been. And so being warned, they went another way and they didn't go back to Herod because they knew. They just knew because God told them, don't go back to Herod and they knew. So they left and they left Herod out of the equation. In verse 13, now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So Joseph gets a word to lead his family and take Jesus and Mary and take them out of that area because 
See, God knows what Herod's going to do when he finds out he's been double-crossed. He's going to come back and he's going to seek Jesus. So Herod's getting angrier and angrier as the days go by and the wise men don't show up and give him word. And then he arose and he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. It's a good idea when God speaks to you that you immediately respond because time is of the essence. And was there until the death of Herod. By the way, he died at 4 AD, so they didn't have very long until they uh, were finished there. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. You'll find that in Hosea 11.1. 1. And it's interesting because all of these passages in the Old Testament were referring to things that were happening then and there at that moment but they also had a second fulfilling in the future. So as you look at the passages in the scriptures and you look back, you can see all sorts of meaning because there are shadows and types throughout the entire Old Testament. And when, when Hosea was speaking of this, he was talking about Israel being his son, being God's son. He spoke of Israel as being that and that he would be called out of Egypt. And if you remember in the book of Exodus, when you have Moses bringing the people out of Egypt and, and crossing over the Red Sea, it's referring to that. But then here is Jesus going out into Egypt, and he says, out of Egypt I will call my son. And so we see this other meaning that is being foreshadowed in the Old Testament about Jesus coming out of Egypt. And then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time in which he had determined from the wise men. So Herod was angry and he was stirred up and he said, I know what I'll do. And they call this the slaughter of the innocents, at least through the ages, uh, church history has called it this. And he went into Bethlehem. It was not a very populous area. It, you, and, and I'm not sure they had many uh, between one and two-year-old children that were there. But he sent men specifically to hunt out children that were that age. And he wasn't going to play games. He was going to take them all. He did not want to take any chances of anyone taking his power, taking his authority. Uh, it was later on in his life as he's doing this, and he's extremely paranoid at this point, and he's got everyone afraid. So he's going to send some people out. Can you imagine somebody coming into your house and taking your child between one and two years old and watching them murdered in front of you? This is what Herod did, and if you don't think that Satan is real, if you don't think there's an evil in this world, uh, you just have to read through the stories and see the devil does not want God to redeem human beings, and he tries to intervene any way he possibly can. And so this, this great slaughter of the innocents occurs, and it's amazing because there is more information about Herod the Great written in books than there is about almost anyone else in that time because he was a king, and he reigned for a good long time. It was about 40 years where he reigned. And so there are all sorts of things, and he had building projects. He did all sorts of um, good, but he also did all sorts of evil, especially in the latter part of his life. So we look, and there's all kinds of information Josephus writes about him, and there's so many other people. The interesting thing is this particular event is not recorded in history other than in the scriptures. And so you think, well, it must not have happened. No, it happened. You have a guy who's paranoid about the king of kings coming, and it sounds, uh, it, it wasn't like there were thousands of babies that were killed, but it was enough. Uh, if, you, if you do your math and you think about 1,500 people in the town of Jerusalem and the surrounding area, how many of them have children between one and two years old and how many of them are male? You start coming up with smaller numbers than maybe what the story would sound like. So it's not, if you're going to report anything about King Herod, it's going to be some of the bigger things. Like he captured hundreds and hundreds of Jewish leaders and had them all corralled in this area in, a, in an amphitheater right about the time he was going to die. And he knew that when he died, no one would weep for him, not his own children, not, a, not the wives that survived him. No one would weep for him. And so he was going to have a slaughter of all of these Jewish leaders the day he died so that there would be mourning in Jerusalem the day he died. 
That's an incredible event. That's the kind of a man that we're dealing with. So it's not so far-fetched to think that this actually really did happen. And I absolutely believe it had. In verse 17, then it was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, a voice was heard at Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and a great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This passage from Jeremiah was written about the Babylonian captivity years before, about how these folks were taken by Babylon, a, 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 an idolatrous nation, and taking away the people, and how Rachel, emblematically mentioning Rachel, weeping for her children, meaning the Jewish people, because they were no more. There again, Scripture prophesying about what would happen beforehand, but you have an event that happened at that time, but you also have an event that it is now foreshadowing, which is the death of all these innocents in, in, the, in the area around Bethlehem. It was only about five miles away. By the way, Rachel is mentioned here because she's buried in Bethlehem. This is actually her tomb. If you go to Bethlehem, you can actually see it to this day. Uh, it's usually the object of much fighting because it's near Hebron. And uh, they typically there are people who put graffiti on it and uh, they captured it for a period of time. So it's a very contested area. But she is the one who is actually buried. Her, her remains are there in Bethlehem. And so Rachel is weeping for her children because they are no more. You can understand the, the picture of what that means. And so you think about all of these folks that have had this onslaught of soldiers that came and just killed all the little baby boys. And you can imagine the bodies just being strewn because soldiers don't care about those things. My goodness, the lengths that the devil has gone to to try to destroy hope for humankind. And yet God knew and God sent them out beforehand. And so as I think about the, the Christmas season and as I think about everything that God did, I think about the wise men, how God sent a sign to them in the star that people out in Persia, far away from God, removed from the Jewish people, that he sent a sign to draw people to Jesus. And I think what a sacrifice they made traveling over 800 miles, taking a chunk of their life to go and see Jesus. What a sacrifice. You know, there is no worship without a sacrifice. It, there's no such thing as a convenient sacrifice. And these men definitely left an example for us as to what they did. Not only that, they came and they gave. They gave gifts. They prepared them in advance to go and bless the Lord with those things and what a benefit it must have been for his family that they weren't uh, impoverished any longer. And for them to go to Egypt and to get out of town was something that they needed to do. And of course, they needed finances to do that. And God supernaturally provided for them. I think about the wise men who looked and sought for Jesus everywhere. And they asked everyone as they went through the town, do you know where he is? Where is the, where is the Savior born? We're, we've come to worship him. And they sought deeply. God is not somebody you'll stumble over. And in fact, there are many scriptures which tell us that we should seek him. We should draw near to him because he will draw near to us. And at this time of the year, we can be sure that God will give us a sign that as we seek him and as we pour out our heart, as we seek to give gifts, even as the wise men did, that God will enlarge our hearts and he will give us the ultimate destination of what we're looking for, which is an intimate face-to-face -face with Jesus. I hope that this year that you will be broken and willing to sacrifice and to give from a loving heart, not one that's because so-and-so gave to me, I'm going to give to them, but a heart like the wise men, because Jesus has called you to do that. The King of Kings has been born, and he's been born to us so that we might be saved. I hope that you have an experience with God this Christmas and that he would bless you and your family with where you are. I miss all of you guys and I look forward to you coming back because it's difficult speaking to an empty room. 
or to a lens when you imagine the people that you love on the other end. But I pray, Father, that you would make this Christmas just so special by adding your presence to our lives, that you might help us to come closer to you, that we might shine like the star over Bethlehem. In Jesus' name, amen.